Thank you, Monica. And uh, I would like also to thank you for a brilliant, brilliant moderation that we have and also for the panelists for give us really full overview on the things that needs to be done. And I'm certainly, uh, I can convince everybody that all of those recommendations just received will find a way in our next IDM brochure that will be uh, published after the end of, uh, of this particular IDM. I was a little bit short of the time and we did have uh, uh, basically, and actually we have now another seven panelists. I will one more time reiterate that you like to listen all. And in that sense, I asking for those that are asking at the floor, uh, and th those that are asking uh, uh, the, the, from the floor to keep their intervention to two minutes and to ask the floor to do Q&A icon or to raise the hand functions. Now I would like actually to start with the following panel and I would like actually uh, to welcome our next moderator to start the next panel. And if we find the time we'll during the, the, the panel or after it, we'll show another video with the migrant story. Thank you. Thank you. So my name is Angelica Broman and I am the Humanitarian Development Peace Nexus Advisor at IOM in Geneva. It's a great honor to be here with you and moderate the panel called Examining the Linkage Between Migration, Environment and Climate Change to the Humanitarian Development Peace Nexus. And as you all know, IOM adheres to the OECDAC recommendations on the HDPN which um, fits very well with our mandate. We work within all the three sectors. We are a triple mandated organization and it's a great pleasure to see and we always look on how we can integrate environment and climate change better into our operations. As mentioned, we have a panel of seven distinguished person. And I think I'll do, I won't introduce all the seven at once, I will start with the first speaker and let that person give a short presentation and then go on to the next uh, due to shortage of time. So with no further ado, and as mentioned, you can put questions during the presentations in the chat and we will make sure that they are responded to. So the first panelist today is Mr. Just, uh, <laughs> Clarenbeck, and I also want to apologize in advance if I mispronounce um, any person's name. Mr. Clarenbeck is a special envoy for migration from the Netherlands. And as ambassador at large, he's worked with governments, international organization and civil society to foster dialogue with countries of origin and transit. He's currently chairing the EU Horn of Africa Migration Dialogue, the Khartoum process, and he's going to talk and give some perspectives from the Netherlands on this issue. So over to you. Thank you very much, um, Angelica. And um, well, many speakers have already said it both yesterday and today, but you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has left some very deep impacts and inequalities. So there is an increased political urgency to act, based as usual, no longer possible. And therefore this international dialogue on migration, focusing on Migration, the environment, and climate change is most timely and urgent. And a big thank you to IMM for, um, for organizing this. The, the urgency to act now is reflected in the disturbing and growing figures on global force displacement. If you look at the year 2019, for instance, almost 2,000 weather related disasters triggered 25 million new displacements across 140 countries and territories. Now, this is the highest figure recorded in a decade. And most important of all, these are three times the number of displacements caused by conflicts and violence. Three times. Climate change is happening as we speak, and it is already affecting the lives of people in multiple ways. In terms of food security, floods, droughts, pushing more than 100 million people below the poverty line in the coming years, and further driving migration as well. And Africa is perhaps the continent most at risk here in the sense of driving forced migration as a result of climate change. The number of people on the move due to climate change related factors will increase strongly over the coming years. According to the African Union, future climate change may cause armed conflict in over 20 African countries and political unrest in maybe 30 other countries. 
And of course, we need to realize that over 75% of the African population is under the age of 35. Therefore, it is important to listen very closely to what youth have to say. African youth may become climate leaders, or they may become displaced, and we have a choice to help you. To address this urgency to act, the Netherlands organized and hosted the first Global Climate Adaptation Summit last January to share knowledge, lessons learned, and how to adapt to climate change. And we learned that an investment of, well, maybe $2 trillion in climate adaptation could deliver over $7 trillion in benefit. Investing in climate adaptation could add up to maybe 0.7 extra economic growth globally. So climate adaptation is the right thing to do. And it is also the smart thing to do. We need to start putting this at the heart of social economic recovery from COVID-19. We in the Netherlands see climate as a fundamental risk to economic and financial stability. And we see climate action as an opportunity to reinvigorate growth after the pandemic and create new green jobs. For us, this is mission critical. And ambition, therefore, will be the word this year, also on the road to COP26. Water, agriculture, economic growth are most affected by climate change, but there are also hugely important pillars for building back. And from the global pandemic and lessons learned over the past year, one quality shines through, and which is the power of global collaboration and partnership. Climate partnerships at all levels are important. We need to link local, national, and global levels for adaptation, strengthen meaningful inclusion in climate decision-making processes, and increase the involvement of a wide range of actors in putting adaptation solutions into practice. And as I said, do involve youth and do involve women. Humanitarian development and peace-building actors must work together to find durable and efficient solutions in the context of climate change and environmental disasters. And this calls for an integrated approach, a new way of working. And in this context, we very much appreciate IOM's initiative and efforts to foster greater cooperation and to enhance cross-sectoral partnerships that concretely address the increasingly complex interconnected migration challenges of today. Now, the pandemic has shown us once more the importance of localization, the need to reduce vulnerabilities of societies, protecting them against shocks. And we need to leverage our collective knowledge, learn from ongoing initiatives, share lessons learned, do joint analysis on risks and how to promote durable solutions, and thus also tackling root causes of irregular and forced migration. As our Prime Minister said last year when the uh, the year of the pandemic restarted. You know, let this not be the year that triggered a lost decade for development and for building a climate resilient world. Emergency response and recovery packages must be aligned with the SDGs and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. And this means we must incorporate incentives to accelerate transformation towards economic recovery powered by low carbon infrastructure, green jobs, and resilient livelihoods. As the cliche goes, building back better is the only way forward. So, in summary, three points. One, climate can be a risk, is a risk to economic and financial stability and security. But climate adaptation and mitigation is also an opportunity for reinvigorating growth after the pandemic. Second point, we do need global cooperation and partnerships at all levels, link local, national and global, strengthen meaningful inclusion, especially for women and youth, in climate decision-making processes. And third, we need to leverage this collective knowledge, learn from ongoing initiatives, share lessons learned, do joint analysis, and promote durable solutions. The COVID-19 pandemic has further increased the urgency to act, and while doing this, we also help tackle the root causes of irregular and forced migration and displacement. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was a very comprehensive. And I said, I think you covered a lot of what um, the HDPN is about localization, putting people first, participatory approach, etc. But we're now going to hand over to Ms. Grata Enda Vadingintayas. I am very sorry for the pronunciation. Ambassador, Permanent Mission of Indonesia to the United Nations and other international organizations in Geneva. Her Excellency will highlight Indonesia's national experience and best practice for regarding climate-induced mobility and disaster risk reduction. 
especially from the perspective of the global compact for migration, where they're a champion country. Are you online? I can't see you. Please. Take yes, I board. am online. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Great. Over to you then. Uh, uh, thank you, Angelita for, Angelica, for giving me the time. Now, before I touch upon the specific question addressed to me, I would like to start with some statistics to give you uh, a context regarding Indonesia, where we are coming from. First, in the Asia-Pacific region alone, the number of international migrants, according to the UNS cap, reached 65 million in 2019. Now, 65 million equal a quarter of the world international migrant that reached almost 300 in 2019. And 65 million is almost equal to the total population of France in 2020, just to give you the perspective. But more importantly, this number is only represent one side of the story, the regular documented migrant. We haven't even talking about the irregular one. We do not have sufficient data to portray the irregular one, which I believe will, could be much more significant in number. Uh, the other thing is UNHCR uh, noted that eight out of the most 10 countries that hit hardest by conflict are among those also exposed to climate hazard. And these eight countries among 10 host nearly 20 million displaced persons fleeing from violence, conflict and persecution. Now, statistic and event also show that people are motivated to migrate for a number of reasons that many of the panel has already said, includes economic, political, environmental, and climate industrial. And all this motivation may also be compounded and interrelated. So migration is an undeniable reality. But let me just bring another understanding that the fact migration is part of human existence. It has been ever happening in the earliest recorded history of mankind. Many human civilization, economic growth in the past were created or driven by migration. And even all the push factors that most uh, uh, colleague panel has already mentioned, including the environmental and climate industries, and it's also caused the the migration many centuries ago. However, of course, the current geopolitical situation, now we are start marking up lines, uh, 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 territory between country makes the situation much, much complex. Then of course, uh, for Indonesia, we also understand that it is important that migration policy focus on tackling the root causes. Uh, some of them like uh, people, consider a, a more uh, preventable causes, but it is also a long-term solution. So for country like Indonesia, it is more possible and realistic for us to combine preventive measure with improvement of our current ma migration management. This is to ensure that when migration happens, then it will happen, it's happening, it will conduct it in a safe, orderly and regular manner. So a comprehensive approach. Now back to the question at hand, over the decades, Indonesia have learned so much from our various experience in responding to domestic climate and natural disaster induced displacement and irregular movement of people. We are a country of 17,000 islands. So can you imagine that? And at least there are three lessons learned that we can share in, in, uh, in the connection of nexus between humanitarian development and peace and migration. First is the need to build a domestic capabilities. Now we learn firsthand the importance of having holistic approach on disaster risk reduction. As a country located in the ring of fire, Indonesia is disaster prone. In 2020 alone, yeah, we already have more than 1,300 disaster occurrence and have already more than 5.1 million people displaced. Now, again, this backdrop, our government for uh, uh, several years now has shifted the focus from disaster risk, uh, uh, disaster response mechanism to disaster risk management and supported by, uh, by a more comprehensive policy framework. Of course, we're taking into account the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. And we also continue to build a better 
uh, and fit for purpose disaster management institution at the national and subnational. Uh, we have uh, Indonesian National Board for Disaster Management at the central governments, but it also has affiliate office at the provincial and district level. So at the national level, we will focus on improving institutional and policies coordination with other agency at the national level, but also in terms of allocation resources. Just remember, we are talking about 17,000 uh, uh, islands of country with 70,000 islands of islands. So allocation of resources is important. How we are making sure that the resources that we have are uh, able to move quickly to address disasters on the other part of our country. At the local, we focus on enhancing uh, disaster response by focusing on the efficiency and efficacy in aid management and aid delivery system. Now we want, uh, I think one of the lessons from uh, many of uh, the disasters that we have and how we are you know, managing uh, uh, help and assistance from other countries, we want to make sure that all program and disaster relief assistance that we receive prioritize the local community interest and not donor driven. Sometimes we have received uh, assistance that are not actually uh, practical to, to be used at the local level, for example. So it's a, another waste of resources. And second, regional approach is often uh, a more a tailor-made solution for us. Now, data shows that most migration happen between countries of the same region. So hence, regional approach, uh, approach uh, fits better because neighbors know best. <laughs> now, allow me to share our experience in establishing the Bali process with uh, Australia in 2002 to address the issue of irregular migration in the region. Now, Bali process have more than 49 uh, countries. It was uh, in the beginning a consultative process, bring uh, 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 countries uh, of origin, transit, as well as destination. Now, most of our members are countries coming from the region, but also, we have members coming from different regions, but these members are an important key player in the migration issue. We also include different uh, UN agency and international organization. So in the beginning, the forum is uh, uh, another platform for uh, information sharing and best practices. But then Andaman Sea crisis happening in 2015. And after that, we experience in the region subsequent cases of irregular maritime migration. And uh, this crisis is another example how Bali process as a regional forum has to adapt its working method. Now, the crisis in 2015 shows that Bali process need to build a more agile and timely response for sudden and large influx of migration. So we are no longer a forum for talk shop and sharing best experience. We have to establish something to respond quickly. So Bali process established what we call the task force on planning and preparedness. It comprised of operational level government official who are responsible at the national level dealing with transport that large movement of migrants and refugee. So <clears throat> through the task force, uh, Bali process tried to create another arm to have a stronger action oriented and infield, infield coordination where communication has to be built among countries in the region from early warning, especially detection of movement of ship carrying uh, people on boat, you know, uh, boat peoples and uh, uh, coordination for search and rescue that sometimes need different country who share maritime uh, border to work together. And we talk about uh, capacity and uh, uh, how to uh, help each other in terms of in this embarkment and management of shelter for these uh, people that we rescue. And uh, st starting last year, because of the pandemic, we also built capacity in responding to this crisis while still adhering to the strict uh, health protocol. We need to protect not only our uh, worker and official at the front line that provide help to the rescue migrant, but we need to make sure the rescue migrant are safe from the COVID. Now, between 2020 and 2021, we have rescued more than um, uh, almost uh, almost 40, 400 Rohingya board people. Majority are women and children. And for Indonesia, it's it's actually a commitment from us to provide assistance and protection, although we are not a party to the 1915 Refugee Convention. The other thing is Bali process has also taught us that first regional uh, management of migrant means we also need 
to work in dealing with the element of transnational crimes, like human trafficking and people smuggling, because these crimes preys on the vulnerability of migrants that is as that desperate to escape their situation in their home countries. The more the other important thing is. Uh, it's important to work with other resourceful countries, uh, particularly the state party to the 1915 uh, convention. Not only resources country have more uh, uh, role in contribution for the funding, but also in accelerating the safe, voluntary and dignified, and of course, resettlement of migrants in our region to outside of uh, Asia Pacific region. Now, the third one is uh, multilateral governance such as GCM. We find GCM, it's really helpful. He has been served as guide for Indonesia to improve our migration governance. For example, the most important thing is for us to identify some of the gaps and missing lead related to the cross-sectoral challenge of migration. In short, GCM has helped us to build a more coordinated migration governance and also help us in the process of developing national action plan. Uh, uh, at the moment, we are uh, doing the national action plan to further implement GCM with the principle of whole government and whole society approach. Now, according to the GCM, uh, there is also a notion that we need to minimize the driver that force people to leave their countries. Yes, we have already agreed on that. But also we need to work towards a world where migration is, is a more a genuine choice, not a necessity. And if this become a genuine choice, then according to GCM, it is also our job to ensure the choice is conducted in safe and orderly manner. On, on the last note, you'd like to touch upon the impact of pandemic on migration. Uh, during the pandemic, we've seen that many countries, including myself, uh, our countries, uh, started to looking inward. And most are struggling to cushion the impact of COVID-19 to the social economic welfare of their people. Uh, uh, and we want to make sure that our people get vaccinated as soon as possible. So it is a difficult time for any country to provide health support and protection for their own citizens. We're not even mentioning health support and protection to the irregular migrant that we are hosting. So can you imagine even those, pro this, this is even a problem for a uh, uh, high income country. Can you imagine the challenge for low and uh, middle income countries with the minimum resources? But at the same time, the reality, they are the one who do the heaviest listing, lifting in immigration because they host the majority of irregular migrant in the world. So therefore, um, uh, just to uh, underline the importance of principle of burden sharing and responsibility sharing is not just a rhetoric, but also observe and implement it, particularly during difficult time, such as the, such as the time of the pandemic. I think that's it for me. And thank you again for your times and listening. So I'm looking forward to hear the views and perspective from other panelists and of course, uh, the question. Thank you, Angelica. Thank you very much. That's exactly what, I mean, you said it all really, the Sendai framework, the heart of HDPN is coordinating, coordinating and enhancing domestic and local capacity. We will probably hear from all of you back at the end of this session, because we will open up for questions and answers. But now with no further ado, it's a great honor for me to present Ms. Cecilia Jimenez Dameri, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of Internally Displaced Person, who will talk about IDPs, human rights, and um, slow onset dimension. Is that with no further ado, uh, and after Ms. Jimenez, we will have General Anciet, if that's okay with you. I see you're on also. Go ahead, Ms. Cecilia. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, actually, good evening to where I'm coming from with uh, very many thanks for the kind invitation of IOM to contribute to the, this first dialogue on migration and specifically to this panel. So let me add to the spectrum, the wide spectrum 
of migration by raising an important and urgent issue that is forced displacement in the context of climate change, which has already been um, uh, attributed uh, by other speakers. Human mobility in the context of climate change and specifically on slow onset adverse effects of climate change can take many forms, including displacement, migration, and planned relocation. In most cases, movement is not entirely voluntary or forced. I think in the previous panel, one of the speakers pointed out that sometimes there is a very, very um, thin line between forced migration, forced displacement, and migration. But rather, sometimes it even falls somewhere in the continuum between the two, with different degrees of voluntariness and constraint. However, in line with the definition of the guiding principles on internal displacement, internal displacement is considered to take place when people are evacuated or flee their homes or places of, of habitual residence, whether to avoid the anticipated effects of a disaster or to remain uh, or, or in the aftermath of a disaster and remain within the country's borders. And so it is within this context that I have been asked to share with you my last report to the General Assembly, which focused on the particular challenges posed by internal displacement in the context of slow onset adverse effects of climate change, as well as its impacts on the enjoyment of human rights of those affected. As defined by the UN FCCC, slow onset Events are events that evolve gradually from incremental changes occurring over many years or from an increased frequency or intensity of recurring events. And that sounds so familiar to all of us. It is very telling that while just some attention has been brought to the human rights challenges resulting from certain types of slow onset disaster displacement, most of the attention has been focused on sudden onset disaster displacement. The human rights implications are both ongoing in all types of disaster displacement, current going on now, as well as generational with much of the effects in the future and in our children and our children's children quite irreversible. So given this context, we have analyzed in my reports that practically all the human rights of the displaced, as well as non-displaced persons, are actually affected and the risk of violations to these human rights increase in, with both time, intensity, as well as frequency of the effects of climate change. And nevertheless, between displaced and non-displaced populations, the differences of the levels of risks and actual violations of human rights actually grow wider and graver over time. Displaced populations having the most, have the most burden of these risk to human rights violations. In addition, within the vast populations of internally displaced persons affected, we likewise need to ensure um, to, to examine and address the particularities of the impacts of climate change on the human rights of specific groups, such as indigenous peoples, pastoralists, women, children and young persons, the elderly and persons with disabilities as well, just to name a few. It is particularly in relation not only to IDPs generally, but to specific groups, that the aspect of loss and damages comes in very succinctly. For example, much of the loss in IDP situations are not actually considered classically loss and damage. Talk about, for example, the loss of culture and language caused by the displacement in indigenous peoples, the loss of traditional livelihoods brought about by damages to land and waters as experienced by persons with special attachment to the lands, and also to the loss and damages of ways of life and the knowledge that this imbibes. This year, the anniversary of the, F of the UN FCCC, it would be incumbent on us to reflect on the so-called unseen, non-material loss and damages that are the result of the adverse effects of climate change brought about by forces placement.
Having said this, however, the only way forward is to ensure that such groups, instead of merely being seen as vulnerable, which is the prevalent view in many of our circles, they should be seen as agents of positive change and agency. It is therefore therefore um, incumbent on us to facilitate in our respective areas of responsibility in this wide spectrum of migration that the, uh, the, the, the setting up, the establishment uh, of conditions that would enable what I call the agency approach. Indeed, in this vein, my mandate has always, always emphasized that the participation of internally displaced persons and other affected people like migrants in decisions affecting them is very essential and is actually a matter of good governance on the part of the authorities. And this is an essential approach to protect the rights of internally displaced persons. My report concludes by reiterating, in fact, the primary responsibility of states to prevent and reduce the risks attributed to such effects of climate change. And we have heard many uh, examples already in this, in this panel, which is very heartening to me. But with the fundamental need, I would like to insist, there is a fundamental need to adopt a human rights and IDP displaced affected person centered approach and response to prevention protection, and solutions. Parallel to the spotlight of state obligations, which is um, an attribute of the primary responsibility of states, an attribute of uh, sovereignty, I stress the importance, of course, of a consolidated and coordinated solidarity approach, an action-oriented approach of the international community to tackle this present situation. In sum, addressing internal displacement as in the, in the wide spectrum of migration within the context of slow onset adverse effects of climate change requires a holistic approach to the complexities and multi-causality of human mobility in this context. It therefore requires both individual and joint action by affected states, multilateralism, and the international community with the IDPs and affected communities themselves. And of course, a multi-stakeholder coordinated approach to climate action, disaster risk reduction, development, peace, human rights protection. It would also be essential to involve peace actors in this in settings where such climate change related um, effects interact with armed conflict. This is the reality we have in many countries. And on the ground, the approach requires other actors other actors as well, for example, business, civil society, national human rights institutions, and other act, independent actors, as well as the academia. Last but certainly not the least, the participation of internally displaced persons, migrants, etc., as required by the human right of political participation and reiterated by many international instruments, including the guiding principles on internal displacement. In addition to my mandate's expert independent report to the General Assembly, which I have just shared with you, and my recommendations, I hope that um, the, the recommendations are taken on board, and, and I, I know that some states have taken them on board, uh, but also to be taken on board by the international community. I also very much hope that the high-level panel uh, of the Secretary General for Solutions to Internal Displacement, which includes disaster displacement, will take a consolidated approach to disaster risk reduction, development, and human rights protection, without which solutions to situations of displacement caused by the effects of climate change cannot be achieved. I would like to conclude by thanking IOM for its valuable contribution to my GA report last year, which I have shared with you just now. And uh, IOM's inputs have much enhanced the perspectives and substance of the analysis of my report. And I would also like to provide, uh, give appreciation for our collaboration on climate change and internal displacement issues. Last but not the least, thank you to IOM for the invitation for me to join this panel, and I look forward to the discussions. Over to you. Thank you very much to you. I feel honored to have you on board, and we should thank you much more than you thanking us. I think 
everything you touched upon, the coordinated approach, ensuring human rights and having participation is something we've strived for for years. And we always want to remember the value of culture and indigenous rights. I think everything you've said is very clear and very relevant, but I am marching on very quickly here because we have a tight panel and the next speaker is General Ancien Nibaruto, Director General of Burundi Civil Protection and Chief Executive National Platform for Risk Prevention and Disaster Management. This is an intersectorial technical committee that coordinates emergency preparedness and response action in Burundi. He will bring important perspectives of how the Burundi government's long-term approach to reduce the number of people displaced due to the effects of natural disaster and climate just has gone. So over to you. Welcome, General. Merci, Madame euh, la Présidente de cette session. Euh, je suis le général de brigade Anisette Nibaruta. Je suis directeur général de la protection civile au Burundi. Je suis également président de la plateforme nationale de prévention des risques et de gestion des catastrophes. Euh, je saisis cette occasion pour remercier les organisateurs pour avoir accepté que le Burundi fasse une présentation sur ses efforts Euh, dans le domaine de la réduction des déplacements des, popula des populations dues aux catastrophes naturelles et aux changements climatiques. C'est aussi euh, une occasion euh, de faire une intervention sur les actions du gouvernement du Burundi euh, dans le cadre du renforcement des capacités institutionnelles euh, pour la mise en œuvre des programmes à long terme euh, de la réduction des effets des catastrophes naturelles et du changement climatique. Comme la plupart des intervenants l'ont si bien dit, la question euh, des déplacements de population euh, due euh, au changement climatique mérite une attention particulière. Et les acteurs humanitaires, les acteurs de développement et ceux de la consolidation de la paix euh, doivent conjuguer leurs efforts euh, pour alléger la souffrance de ces communautés, communautés en déplacement, en assurant leur protection et en répondant de manière visible à leurs besoins. Donc, pour réduire le nombre de personnes en déplacement, le gouvernement du Burundi a pris la question de réduction des risques de catastrophes comme une priorité nationale. C'est ainsi qu'en 2007, le gouvernement du Burundi a mis en place la plateforme nationale de prévention des risques et de gestion des catastrophes. Il s'agit d'une structure qui est chargée et de coordonner toutes les actions de préparation et de réponse aux urgences. Et cette structure offre un cadre d'échange aux intervenants dans le domaine de la gestion des urgences pour justement échanger, débattre sur les actions à mener pour préparer et aussi pour répondre. Et avec les acteurs, le gouvernement du Burundi a développé plusieurs aspects. Et je dois aussi dire que euh, au niveau de la structure de réduction des risques et des catastrophes, euh, cette structure va jusque dans la commune, et passant par la province, et chaque commune qui est prise comme une entité de développement est dotée d'un plan euh, communal de développement communautaire. C'est ça la base de développement. Et avec OIM, euh, qui est chargé euh, de, de suivi ou de mettre en œuvre l'effet 4 du plan cadre des Nations Unies pour l'aide au développement, UNDAF. Et, et je dois ici dire que l'OIM au Burundi est très impliqué euh, dans la gestion des risques des catastrophes. Et l'OIM euh, assure le corridor du groupe de travail des, des acteurs humanitaires et de développement euh, qui, sont, qui interviennent quand il s'agit des aspects de réduction des risques des catastrophes. Et ces structures offrent un cadre où les acteurs planifient ensemble et ces planifications évite, conjointes évitent des duplications d'une part et nous permettent d'optimiser d'autre part l'utilisation des ressources. Avec ses partenaires, essentiellement OIM, le Burundi dispose alors d'une stratégie nationale de réduction des risques des catastrophes et qui intègre aussi le genre et qui est aligné au cadre de Sendai et aussi qui est aligné au plan national de développement 2018 et 2017, de 2018 et 2027, pardon. 
Et le gouvernement du Burundi aussi dispose d'un plan au sec. Il s'agit d'un plan d'organisation de la réponse de sécurité civile. Et ce plan est destiné à mettre en place des organes de réponse et nous avons déjà mis en place certains services qui sont prévus par ce plan. Et le centre d'opération d'urgence de santé publique est opérationnel et c'est ce centre qui est en train de gérer la COVID-19. Nous avons déjà mis en place le centre national d'opération d'urgence et ce centre abrite le centre régional d'excellence pour la réduction des risques des catastrophes parce que le Burundi a été choisi par les pays membres de la communauté africaine d'abriter de, de, le centre régional d'excellence compte tenu de l'avancée assez significative que nous enregistrons dans le domaine de la gestion des situations d'urgence. Avec l'appui de ses partenaires aussi, et je dois revenir aussi sur l'appui de l'OIM, nous disposons d'un plan de contingence. Un plan de contingence, comme vous le savez par définition, c'est une préparation de la réponse en anticipation d'un événement. Et ce plan, qui a été préfacé par le Premier ministre, et pour nous donner l'autorisation de, la, de le mettre en œuvre, et ce plan nous donne les, 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 les risques majeurs auxquels le Burundi fait face actuellement. Premièrement, nous sommes en train de gérer le groupe des maladies épidémiques. De là, je dois parler de la COVID-19, du paludisme, de l'Ebola et du choléra. Je dois aussi signaler ici que le Burundi n'a pas encore enregistré de cas de la maladie à virus Ebola, mais compte tenu de notre emplacement qui est proche du lieu où provient cette maladie dans la République démocratique du Congo, nous devons tirer un plan de préparation. Un autre risque majeur que nous avons, il s'agit des inondations. Et les inondations au Burundi créent beaucoup et occasionnent beaucoup de mouvements de déplacement. Beaucoup de personnes sont en déplacement à cause des inondations et nous avons des inondations dans les zones qui sont dans les plaines et dans les dépressions. Nous devons aussi tirer, et nous avons déjà tiré un plan euh, de gestion des agents euh, chimiques, biologiques, radiologiques et nucléaires. Nous disposons d'un mécanisme national euh, de communication en situation euh, de crise. Je dois informer les participants euh, à, à ce dialogue international sur la migration que depuis 2015, le Burundi a connu des événements successifs météorologiques extrêmes qui ont occasionné de fortes précipitations et ces précipitations ont occasionné beaucoup de déplacements de personnes. Et nous avons connu le phénomène El Niño. Nous avons connu ce qu'on a appelé du pôle de l'océan Indien et nous avons connu aussi un phénomène météorologique qu'on appelle Madel Julian Oscillation. Ces trois phénomènes, comme je l'ai dit tantôt, ont occasionné beaucoup de mouvements de personnes suite à la précipitation qui nous ont occasionné. Entre 2018 et 2020, nous avons connu plus de 200 000 personnes qui étaient en déplacement et nous avons des chiffres qui sont donnés par l'outil de suivi des déplacements de population qu'on appelle DTM et c'est OIM qui nous a initiés à utiliser cet outil. Nous remercions vivement l'OIM pour avoir introduit au Burundi en 2015 cet outil de DTM qui nous a aidé de, de, de savoir, de connaître les, les personnes en mouvement parce qu'en 2015, le Burundi a connu une situation de crise qui était liée à, à, à un problème euh, sociaux, au problème socio-politique et jusqu'à aujourd'hui, nous continuons à utiliser cet outil. Permettez-moi, euh, Madame la Présidente, euh, de faire une intervention de manière euh, brève sur les aspects et de l'enforcement de capacités que le gouvernement a fait. Le gouvernement a fait des renforcements de capacités pour, sur les, les, les institutions, les structures de réduction des risques des catastrophes en vue de réduire les mouvements de population. Alors, avec OIM, nous, nous sommes en train d'élaborer une cartographie des risques et OIM a identifié et choisi le consortium IDOM et Rambol. Et, et ce consortium est en train de nous aider à avoir une cartographie des risques et cela va nous permettre de mieux connaître les risques de catastrophes auxquelles nous faisons face et cet outil sera étalé sur l'ensemble du territoire national. 
et les utilisateurs de cet outil, ils seront formés sur le contenu de la cartographie et comme ça, on sera euh, initié et on comprendra mieux de comment utiliser cet outil extrêmement important. Les déplacements que nous avons au Burundi sont liés au changement climatique à plus de 85%. C'est pour cela que pour réduire ces déplacements de population, nous devons réduire les causes qui sont les, les effets des catastrophes et naturelles et du changement euh, climatique. Alors, dans ce cadre de renforcement des capacités, nous avons développé des actions de formation, des formations élargies et intensives et conséquemment aux moyens disponibles, nous dotons des équipements de secours aux structures de réduction des risques de catastrophes au Burundi. Nous sommes en train de faire une promotion de l'autosuffisance alimentaire où nous groupons les gens dans des associations et l'impact est visible. Maintenant, même le gouvernement a, a, a déterminé le prix par kilo du maïs parce que la production du maïs au Burundi pour cette période est excédentaire à cause de cette approche de, de, de créer des associations et que les gens évoluent en association et c'est une bonne approche et cela va leur permettre va permettre aux communautés eh, d'avoir eh, une autosuffisance alimentaire. Eh, nous avons initié l'intégration de la réduction des risques des catastrophes et de l'adaptation au changement climatique dans les programmes de planification de développement durable. C'est ainsi que nous avons un plan de développement national 2018-2027 qui tient compte de la réduction des risques des catastrophes et qui tient compte aussi de l'adaptation au changement climatique. Nous sommes en train de développer un mécanisme d'alerte précoce multi-risque et nous avons besoin de manière criante et cet aspect. Nous avons mis en place une équipe nationale de collecte, de traitement et de diffusion de données sur les catastrophes passées pour pouvoir mieux gérer les catastrophes à venir. Et nous, nous, avons, nous prenons en compte, chaque fois que nous gérons les risques de catastrophes, nous, gérons, nous tenons en compte des thématiques transversaux comme les droits humains, comme le genre et les autres groupes vulnérables, ainsi que le dispositif minimum d'urgence en santé sexuelle et reproductive. Et là, nous, nous allons mettre en place un comité national qui sera chargé du suivi du dispositif minimum d'urgence en santé sexuelle et reproductive. Nous avons développé et la culture du risque à travers l'intégration de la réduction des risques et des catastrophes dans les programmes de formation scolaire. Et c'est une approche qu'on commence à initier. Et à l'Université du Burundi, nous avons déjà un niveau master pour la réduction des risques et des catastrophes. Et dans d'autres paliers de formation, nous avons déjà intégré des cours de formation liés à la réduction des risques et des catastrophes. Et nous, 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 nous allons poursuivre cet aspect. Nous faisons aussi la promotion de la communication qui est extrêmement importante pour la gestion des risques et des catastrophes. C'est ainsi que nous avons un réseau national de communication et d'information pour la réduction des risques et des catastrophes. Nous reconnaissons un défi au domaine de la recherche. Nous, nous sommes très en arrière au niveau de la recherche scientifique pour avoir une technologie de pointe, mais comme nous savons ce dont nous avons besoin, nous espérons que nous allons et y arriver. Nous faisons aussi la promotion des groupes sectoriels. La plateforme nationale coordonne neuf groupes sectoriels et ces groupes sectoriels sont dirigés par les structures et ministères, départements ministériels et les corrides sont assurés par les agences des Nations Unies qui ont un mandat spécifique par la cour au groupe, à chaque groupe sectoriel. Et nous, avons, nous voulons intégrer de manière visible le secteur privé la confession, la confession religieuse et la société civile. Et nous avons à ce niveau un défi, les banques et les sociétés d'assurance n'ont pas encore adhéré à cette approche, mais nous allons continuer à les approcher pour qu'ils ils intègrent aussi la thématique de la réduction des risques de catastrophes dans ce qu'ils font. Euh, pour terminer, je dois aussi dire que nous sommes dans un vaste programme de mobilisation euh, de l'investissement pour la réduction des risques de catastrophes ainsi, l'année passée, le gouvernement du Burundi a créé un fonds national de réduction des risques des catastrophes, mais il reste aujourd'hui à alimenter ce fonds parce qu'aujourd'hui, on utilise les fonds 
que nous avons à travers des partenariats. À travers ces partenariats, nous avons des projets. Ces projets que nous avons, nous avons un projet de réduction des risques de catastrophes et de résilience communautaire, et ainsi, ainsi que euh, de euh, renforcement des capacités institutionnelles avec PNUT, avec OIM, avec Oxfam, avec CARE International, avec World Vision et d'autres organisations. Voilà comme le temps nous est, qui nous est imparti est trop court. Je dois m'arrêter ici pour attendre la réaction des autres panélistes et je suis prêt à répondre euh, à toutes les questions qui me seront posées. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Merci, Général. Et pardon, parce que je ne parle pas français, mais it is very impressive what Burundi is doing, very comprehensive approach and uh, I appreciate everything you do. You have the local uh, university involved, you are integrating in schools, you're working with IOM's DTM to get the facts. I am I'm highly impressed. I know very little about Burundi, but it is extremely interesting to hear all the work you're doing. And uh, I wish we had more time for every panelist to expand, but With no further ado, I have I have uh, three more panelists, and then we open up for questions. So from Colombia, we should have uh, Madame Farai Calier Gonzalez, who is uh, Director of Economy at the Colombian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. She was previously Council of International Affairs at the Permanent Mission of Colombia to the United Nations. So, por favor, si la señora está, if you are here, please take Thank the you. floor. Thank you, Madam Moderator. And, eh, buenos días, buenas tardes, buenas noches para todos. Un saludo especial para todos los distinguidos panelistas que nos acompañan el día de hoy. También gracias a la OIM por la invitación para poder eh, presentar nuestra visión sobre el vínculo entre la migración, el medio ambiente, el cambio climático y el nexo entre la ayuda humanitaria, el desarrollo y la paz. El Acuerdo de París representa un avance en reconocer que debe haber un mejor balance entre la mitigación y la adaptación al cambio climático. Muchas veces quienes sufren en mayor medida los impactos del cambio climático son aquellos países, personas y comunidades que menos responsabilidad tienen en las causas de este fenómeno. Por eso, la adaptación, el incremento de la resiliencia climática y la gestión del riesgo de desastres es una prioridad especialmente para países vulnerables al cambio climático como Colombia. El cambio climático con la pérdida de biodiversidad y servicios ecosistémicos, la contaminación y la degradación del medio ambiente también tienen impactos diferenciados entre países y sobre diferentes segmentos de la población. En nuestro Plan Nacional de Desarrollo y nuestra comunicación determinada a nivel nacional, comunicada en diciembre del 2020, nos hemos trazado una meta de contar con planes de adaptación al 100% del territorio nacional. Queremos territorios y comunidades adaptadas y resilientes al clima y hemos trabajado para que las soluciones al cambio climático provengan de las mismas comunidades. Sin duda, uno de los mayores retos que tenemos es el de capacidades, tecnología y financiamiento para la adaptación. La adaptación y la gestión del riesgo requieren inversiones cuantiosas en infraestructura resiliente al clima en tecnología para la agricultura y los sistemas alimentarios, entre otras necesidades. Por esto creemos que la cooperación internacional es clave. Confiamos en que podamos llegar a acuerdos ambiciosos sobre estas materias en la COP26. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much. I think Colombia has done a lot of interesting work as well. I've been asked now by the interpreters if we can speak a bit slower in, to ensure that they can um, follow the discussion. It's, there's a lot of things we want to get out and there's a lot of people on the Q&A that want to open. So I will just launch in, we have two more speakers. So first it's Mr. Andrew Harper, Special Advisor on Climate Action from UNHCR who will talk about UNHCR's um, perspective on HDPN and how they work with their strategic framework for climate action. So Mr. Harper, if you're online, over to you. 
Okay, no, no, thank you very much, Angelica, and thank you. And, and then remember to speak rather slowly, sorry. <laughs> okay, no, thanks, Angelica, and thanks, IOM, and um, thank you to all the participants. The, I don't think I need to stress the challenges that the world is facing um, in relation to, to climate change and the, the evidence that exists in order to help us have a much more informed position on um, steps that we need that we all need to take in order to provide the necessary dignity and in order to empower those people who are very much on the front lines of the climate emergency. However, I don't think it's sufficient for any of us just to look at the current situation. And, and I would say that we're still not investing sufficiently in supporting adaptation and prevention. There's still a lot of talk about it, but as our friends, whether they be in the Philippines or Indonesia or Burundi or Colombia can attest, it's the, it's the people on the ground that we need to give them an option. We need to give them an option that they don't have to move in order to find a future. We have been working very closely with IOM and, and I'd like to particularly pay um, credit to Dina and her crew on the climate um, on the climate team there, who have been very inclusive, uh, particularly in relation to how UNHCR and IOM have been working to address um, that very close link between uh, people being forced to move and people choosing to move. Um, and one of the key elements that we're increasingly seeing across the world is that trying to identify and to attribute the reason why people are moving is becoming increasingly fraught. And this is why it is important that agencies such as IOM and UNHCR and others continue to work very closely together. And for those governments who are also on this session to, to, today, whether they be donors or hosting states, I think some of the examples of where UNHCR and IOM working together uh, can provide a best practice because it's not only due to migration or to conflict that people are moving, we also need to also take into account some of the other mega trends. And whether that be urbanization, whether it be changes in livelihood, whether it be looking at massive population growth in, in certain countries, including in, in Africa, we're not going to be able to change um, the dynamics. People are going to move the increase in global temperatures are going to continue to increase. And so we're going to have to adapt. What UNHCR is particularly trying to do and working again with world leaders, uh, world leaders in, in particularly in trying to anticipate the future and, and looking at uh, the impact of climate is to see how we can identify where vulnerable groups exist at the moment, but where groups will be forced to move uh, in the future, because where those vulnerabilities are enhanced, where those underlying grievances are not addressed, then conflict will potentially break out. And so we're trying to move from very much a reactive approach to a proactive approach and looking to work with key stakeholders, governments, uh, both the hosting governments, as well as development actors to see whether we can uh, limit and mitigate conflict before it starts. And again, this is something which is much bigger than just um, one agency or one system. But we know what's going to be happening. And so we need to be better prepared. So I would just like to, um, again, keep this relatively short because I, I know we've, there's been a lot going on already. Uh, but to applaud IOM um, on its collaborative approach and the need for us to be focusing more on people where they are at the moment before they're forced to move. And I would also recognize the work of the Special Rapporteur on IDPs by saying that people are displaced internally before they cross the border. And it's up to us to determine 
whether we can provide the necessary assistance and protection where people are before they are forced to move further afield. So what the future holds is largely up to us to determine. Over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Harper. I truly believe that it's only as a one UN we can actually work together. So I appreciate you, your intervention, especially much here. The last speaker, and not the least, is Mr. Ignacio Packer, the Executive Director from the International Council of Voluntary Agencies. He's going to highlight different issues around climate change and the humanitarian action. I think if you're online, with no further ado, I will hand over to you and then we will open for questions and answers. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Angelica Broman. And, um, Really happy to be back on the uh, IDM and uh, really pleased to, to be able to speak on this uh, panel after uh, six really very interesting uh, contributions from Burundi, from Indonesia, from uh, Colombia, well documented. Uh, the special envoy for migration from the Netherlands, um, uh, Cecilia, of course, the special uh, uh, rapporteur on uh, human rights for internally displaced persons. And then now following uh, an uh, Andrew from uh, UNH UNHCR, I would cut short on some of the elements I, I was going to say and uh, um, uh, focus very much on um, and, and very, very focused on the, uh, the nexus uh, perspective if not, it can bring me into a number of, uh, of other directions. First, I would like to, to say that um, uh, IGVA, being uh, the diverse global network of uh, humanitarian NGOs, so the operational footprint of the members is approximately $20 billion, but it's the diversity which is also a strong added uh, value, including for the discussions around uh, policy at national, uh, regional and, uh, and global level. We just had our 18th uh, General Assembly last week and we have stepped up uh, the commitments and ambitions to meet the humanitarian protection challenges already being amplified by the climate and environment emergency and also to mitigate and prepare uh, for those to come. So we have a NIGVA 2030 strategy adopted uh, last, last week by the General Assembly, which presents transformations of which addressing the impact of climate change on humanitarian action is one of them. So the perspective of transformations in, of course, the way uh, we uh, uh, operate and the IGVA uh, General Assembly also adopted commitments and a motion to action on environment, climate and humanitarian action, which includes the uh, IGVA network signing on the climate and environment charter for humanitarian organizations. Now, uh, just before uh, joining the uh, IDM, I moderated the closing uh, panel of IGVA's uh, annual conference which this year was on climate, environment, and humanitarian um, action. So what I would share uh, with you here also comes from some of the discussions that we have had around in the, the annual conference on the collaboration uh, or the collaborative action among member states, donors, multilateral organizations, uh, and the, we, the need to work across humanitarian development, peace, climate nexus. So, and the five points that I would be looking at are on collective action, on the focus on challenging environments, on locally led adaptation, on investments, and then one on prevention that I'll make shorter, but I would insist, insist on it. And I hope for the interpreters that have a really long day and a difficult task that, the, that I'm speaking uh, slow enough, but at the same time, knowing that I have to go fast. <laughs> So on the collective action, we need to work together to strengthen our response from developing our knowledge and practice to influencing others. So they contribute to strengthen climate action in fragile and conflict affected places. We must address the humanitarian development and climate silos and human needs and aspirations are not categorized in these silos. People must be at the center of everything, everything we do, and we must focus on meeting the needs, 
rights and aspirations of people. Systems must be adapted to them and not the other way around. The second point is the focus on challenging environments. There has been work to date to bring together humanitarian and development actors to agree on collective outcomes. And we need now to agree on collective outcomes on climate resilience as a core part of the Nexus approaches. And uh, that has started in the Sahel, for instance, Sahel regions uh, severely impacted by land degradation, water scarcity and climate change, uh, where we see coordinated support for disaster preparedness and resilience across development and humanitarian funding. In an ideal world, the combined efforts of humanitarian development and peace actors in any given location would result in a comprehensive response that meets the immediate and long-term needs of individuals, communities, and societies. In practice, well, in practice, the limited tolerance for risk of development actors often prevents them from fully engaging in areas most affected by armed conflicts. And climate risks and environmental degradation can further fuel intercommunal tensions and violence and shape dynamics of violence. The gap between the ideal world and what is in practice has led humanitarian organizations to engage in long-term programming to strengthen resilience, notably through livelihood support and water and sanitation activities. And there are limits to the abilities of uh, humanitarians to compensate for the comprehensive development that provides solid avenue for climate adaptation. There are places where humanitarians work, uh, where instability and fragility do not allow inclusive development efforts. Activities necessary to facilitate people's adaptation often beyond the scope of the capacities of humanitarian actors. We need to find ways collectively to ensure that gradual steps are taken to help reduce people's vulnerability, even in highly challenging environments. Otherwise, people would be left with no option but to move. The impacts of climate change are disproportionately experienced by people in vulnerable situations. That has been mentioned before and just want to insist of how it is important to have the great, to, to look at those with the greatest need of protection, the internally displaced people, the refugees, the migrants in vulnerable situations, stateless less persons, um, including women, children, older persons, people with disabilities, LGBTQI plus people, indigenous peoples, the third point on locally led adaptation, we must address the past failures of inadequate humanitarian development investment in the communities. Principal partnerships among the local and international actors has to be in the forefront. The leadership, knowledge and capacities of the communities, local organizations and local authorities are to be generally respected and further empowered. More resources have to be directed to the communities at the local level, on community systems, on community infrastructure, whereby people can truly own the initiatives. This includes life-saving anticipatory action before a shock based on forecasts and risk analysis. We know this reduces the impacts of a disaster and reduces the humanitarian needs. Early May, a communique issued by the G7 said it welcomes the principles for locally led adaptation. In reference to principles for locally led adaptation developed to help ensure that local communities are empowered to lead sustainable and effective adaptation to climate change at the local level. The United Kingdom and Irish governments, among uh, some of the governments, uh, leading global institutions and local and international NGOs 
have already endorsed these principles and are adv advocating their endorsement by others. This is encouraging, but of course, what counts is actions. Rapidly on investments, strengthening responses requires addressing critical gaps in climate finance. For now, despite the clear vulnerability of conflict affected communities, they are neglected by climate finance. The International Institute for Environment and Development Research indicates that less than 10% of global climate finance is dedicated to local action. It's even rarer for investment reaching the local level to be locally led. Stronger investment in climate adaptation through longer term, more systematic support to local actors to help strengthen resilience in fragile and conflict affected countries. And making it very short for prevention. We of course call for rebalancing our efforts to focus more on measures that can be taken to limit people's exposure and strengthening their resilience to risks while continue to respond to emergency needs. This includes promoting the rules of IHL protecting the natural environment without which human life is impossible. These are key elements that have just come out from um, different organizations, different speakers from our discussions at our annual conference. And with this, I wish to thank IOM for the cooperation with civil society organizations on a broad range of migration issues at global, regional, national, and local levels. To Dina and the climate team, I express my appreciation for IOM's engagement for, uh, to sustain, uh, for sustained and mutually beneficial interaction with IGVA and its members that builds on synergies in policy and operational areas of migration for the benefit of all. Thank you. Thank you very much. We do appreciate, and I think all of the panelists have touched upon the importance of put, putting people at the center and work coordinated as the HDPN Nexus approach actually uh, advocates. We have now reached the end of the panel and we have a lot of people who want to intervene, but we're going to start with um, a person from Venezuela followed by Canada. So Mr. Antonio Morillo, General Director for Multilateral Affairs. If you're online, please take the floor now. Now I have the Canadian speaker whose name I don't, I lost here, sorry. It's, it's right Kilburn. on the screen, Angelica. <laughs> Tim Kilburn, it is, right? Yes, that's it, you got it, thanks sorry so much. Sorry about that. Welcome. No problem, Angelica, thanks. Well, I'm um, you know, just delighted to be here and I, I, I wanted to, um, Thank you for this, this amazing uh, conference I've uh, been following over the last couple of days. Um, as you know, Canada is an active member of the IOM, so we're really, really delighted that you've been at the forefront of the global response to climate-induced displacement and, and climate migration. Um, we also value the efforts of other international partners, the United Nations Refugee Agency and, and the Platform for Disaster Displacement uh, in, in looking at these topics and, you know, with such um, concern and, 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 and such uh, integrity. You know, um, Canada's a strong supporter uh, of the Global Compact for Migration. We're a champion country, so um, we really appreciate the efforts of the um, UN Network on Migration to ensure that climate migration will be an area of focus at the, um, at the forum next year, the International Migration Review Forum. So thank you to uh, all of you for your hard work. I won't talk about Canada. Uh, too much. We, we, you know, we don't have much time. Uh, we're already running over time, so I'll, I'll stop there. But just a big thank you uh, to everyone who's working so hard on this project, and I've really enjoyed all the interventions today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, and we appreciate the support that Canada has always given us. And um, I'm going to hand over to Deshan now because he has read who is on the list to speak. Are you there? 
presentation? Yes, I'm here. Basically, we have three more uh, uh, attendees that actually ask for the floor. We have uh, Madagascar, fo followed by Philippines, followed by Russian Federation. Uh, first, I think we need to give the floor to representative of Madagascar, Lanto Rahajarezifi, if I pronounce properly the family name. Please go ahead. Yeah. Um, bonjour à tous. Uh, merci uh, uh, pour les panélistes pour uh, cette excellente uh, présentation. Uh, à Madagascar, des mouvements migratoires anciens, lointains et complexes ont uh, produit des impacts environnementaux alarmants, exacerbés par les effets des changements climatiques. Ces dernières années, une augmentation vers les centres urbains et les zones rurales de l'Ouest et du Nord-Ouest a été constatée. L'élévation du niveau de la mer, l'érosion côtière, la sécheresse, la désertification et la salinisation, la dégradation des terres et des forêts et la baisse de la fertilité des sols, les inondations causées par les cyclones constituent les principales causes de ces déplacements. Si la dégradation de l'environnement et les catastrophes naturelles peuvent provoquer la migration, les mouvements non encadrés de population peuvent également avoir des effets significatifs sur l'environnement local et l'écosystème. En effet, à Madagascar, les populations se déplacent des zones du sud vers des zones plus humides, permettant l'accès à l'eau, aux forêts, à des terrains agricoles, favorisant la, les cultures sur brûlis et l'agriculture euh, irriguée. Ces déplacements contribuent ainsi au développement des nouvelles filières économiques rentables et à la constitution de main-d'œuvre importante. Mais des études relèvent que ces activités économiques détruisent massivement l'environnement, notamment les forêts, et vont aggraver les impacts des changements climatiques. Par ailleurs, l'augmentation importante du départ et une euh, migration interne non maîtrisée représente un défi supplémentaire pour le développement durable et inclusif de Madagascar et constitue ainsi une menace à la paix et à la cohésion sociale. L'occupation foncière par les arrivants favorise les conflits sociaux. Les tensions ethniques apparaissent suite aux difficultés de cohabitation euh, et d'interaction entre les cultures et pratiques de nouveaux arrivants et euh, celles des euh, communautés hautes. Les régions d'où proviennent les migrants sont donc touchées aussi bien que les régions où ils, euh, où ils transitent ou s'installent. En raison de la pandémie du COVID-19 et des restrictions de déplacement euh, mises en place, euh, par le gouvernement Malagas pour limiter le, la propagation du virus, nous avons assisté à une quasi-absence de flux migratoires en 2020. La levée de restrictions de déplacement vers la fin de l'année 2020 et vers le début de 2021 a pourtant conduit à des déplacements massifs de la population du Sud touchée par le, la sécheresse et la famine vers le Nord et les centres urbains du pays. Bien que le gouvernement ait pris des mesures pour assister et accompagner les migrants dans les localités de destination, cette vague massive de déplacements n'était pas sans conséquence sur le plan social, notamment en matière d'accès aux soins, d'accès à l'éducation et d'accès aux services de base. Conscient des enjeux de la migration sur le développement du pays, le gouvernement malagas a mis en place une observatoire des migrations internes en décembre 2020 avec l'appui de l'OIM et du PNUD. Elle permettra la production et la diffusion à Madagascar et à l'étranger des recherches sur les migrations pour le développement étendu et pour développer l'étendue des connaissances sur le sujet et ses nombreuses ramifications. C'est le premier centre de recherche sur le sujet euh, et la, la première plateforme de, euh, de référence, d'échange et de renforcement des capacités sur le phénomène des migrations internes à Madagascar. Donc, ces recherches permettront de contribuer au renforcement des capacités des autorités et des autres acteurs concernés afin de mieux prendre en compte les migrations dans l'élaboration des politiques au niveau national et régional. Bien que ne disposant pas encore de politiques migratoires nationales, Madagascar reste très engagé en faveur d'une meilleure gouvernance de la migration au niveau national, régional, international. Je vous remercie. Uh, I would like to thank you for this uh, inspiring, actually, speech. And I uh, would like now to give the floor to representative of the Philippines of the Climate Commission of the Philippines, Mr. Alexis Lapiz. Uh, firstly, I'd like to uh, greet uh, everyone. Uh, Good evening, and uh, I'd like also to thank the uh, panelists for uh, sharing uh, 
insightful uh, uh, ideas on the topics. And uh, of course, uh, this event is very timely. And uh, considering the urgent uh, international discourse dissecting the interrelational and nexus between three interrelational issues, that is climate change, environmental degradation, and their impacts on migration. As such, in the Philippines, we believe that we should focus on the use of applicable management framework that places the elements in the right places, not forcing them to come together in a contrived nexus approach. In this case, we are dealing with defined elements that fall into the following categories. Drivers that generate the, the risk, the impact generators, and the impact recipients. To trace the risk resources all the way to manifested impacts, this risk management framework is of utmost importance because it does not only generate predictability in terms of the interactions of the various phenomena involved in this discourse, but it can systematically pin down responses from countries in a more predictable manner, not to mention cost efficiency and cost effectivity. So in this session, we track the humanitarian development and peace issues vis-a-vis -vis climate change, environment, and human-centric phenomenon like migration. And depending on how it fully manifests can be a negative or positive indicator of how the attendant risks are handled. As we have, continuous, uh, as we have consistently indicated, climate change and environmental degradation are physical drivers which generate risk that can translate to impacts, which may be translate intermediate or more permanent and long lasting. A humanitarian situation is normally the result of an unmanaged risk, hence the materialization of impacts in the nature of a disaster. A peace outcome is also a result normally transitioning from a conflict situation catalyzed by either physical or socioeconomic drivers to one of lasting peace and development or the generation again into a humanitarian crisis and or undevelopment. It is quite unclear, therefore, that physical drivers can catalyze socioeconomic outcomes which may be positive or negative depending on how the coronal risks are managed. But then again, the drivers can also be triggered by human actions. We would like to reiterate our strong recommendation to apply a systematic risk management framework in the management of these physical and socioeconomic risks, threatening our countries today. We are further recommending the take up of the probabilistic risk assessment, the result of which will, under will underpin our anticipatory adaptation and sustainable development aspiration towards lasting peace and avoiding temporary or permanent migration of affected population. On the, issuance of, on the issue of capacity building, which we think is key to the efficient implementation of effective risk management actions, we strongly recommend development of knowledge and competencies of all players on the conceptual notion, as well as the practical applications of the risk management approach. It is important that everyone involved in the comprehensive process level of on, the, of on the basis as well, the use of more innovative risk management approaches, which will certainly need to evolve over time, considering also the changing nature of the hazards and their attendant risk. Madam Chair, we'd like to thank you for this opportunity for giving the Philippines the shared thinking on these issues. Thank you. Then I would like to uh, hand floor back uh, uh, to our moderator, uh, Angelica, to have the closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we have a few minutes left. So every panelist, if they want, can give one last comment. For me, it's been a pleasure to sit through this and learn a lot from all of you. But I will start with Mr. Clarenbeck. Would you like to have some last words? Very short. Well, Sure. Thank you very much, uh, Angelica, and thank you very much, everyone, uh, for uh, participating in this discussion. 
for me, the key message that I would like to repeat again is that climate change is a huge challenge, a huge risk in many ways, but climate adaptation can also be an opportunity, an opportunity to rebuild. If we do that in the proper way, by focusing on learning, by involving local actors, and by listening to women and youth and asking what they need, we can help build livelihoods, build resilience, and doing that also work on um, one of the key drivers and the key root causes of forced migration and displacement. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I like your, op you know, it's an opportunity. It's something positive. Miss Vendenitias, I can't, Grata, I can't pronounce your last name. Would you like to give a few words? Uh, thank you, Angelica. Please don't worry about my last name. It is also difficult for many Indonesians. So just thank everyone for a very enlightening uh, presentation. I just want like to reiterate some of my points. Of course, the first on the need to enhance domestic capabilities, both legal framework, institutional building, also ensuring adequate resources at the national and local level to improve our effort to address the, for example, climate-induced uh, regular movement of people. And second, it's also important to build a regional approach that is tailor-made to the situation of each respective region. And of course, the importance of multilateral governance uh, framework to assist state in identifying gaps and missing links. And of course, I would like again to raise the importance of uh, uphold and observe the principle of burdens and responsibility sharing. So it's not just becoming another rhetoric. Um, I also would like to support a point made by uh, the UNSR on IDP, Ms. Jimenez de Mari, on the importance of having a human rights center approach on migration. Now we have, uh, we already have tools to build such a process at the national, regional, and international level. For example, the Convention on the Right of Migrant Workers and Members of Their Family. A lot of people forgot we have this convention. So it is therefore important for us to promote universal ratification of this convention. Another point is as a fellow archipelagic nation, I would like, I think it's important to reiterate concern being raised by uh, the Prime Minister of Fiji yesterday that we need to pay more attention on refugees coming from small island state who's not only existent culture, but also its sovereignty in jeopardy because, in jeopardy because of uh, climate change. Now, most of our discussion on climate change induced uh, migration still very much focus on movement uh, on land. So I think it's important we take a, a, a issue on, on this uh, maritime aspect of, of migration. And facing the challenge on climate change, including its migration impact, I think we should think this as a part of one planet rather as an individual country. It's a, it's a work for everyone. Thank you, Angelica. Thank you very much. I do agree. We have one planet and one humanity. So UN Special Rapporteur, Ms. Cecilia Jimenez Damare, you've already said so many good and <laughs> profound words, but I'm giving you the floor again. Okay. Well, thanks again for the, for for this uh, opportunity. I just would like to reiterate by my my message that addressing the the internal displacement and migration, in the context of climate change, requires a holistic approach to the complexities and multicausality of human mobility in this context requires individual and joint action, but also it requires participation of the IDPs and the communities themselves. And so that's my first message again. But secondly, also to ensure that when we include internally displaced persons um, in decision in, 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 and, and have them participate in decisions affecting them, we're also very clear about this, the, the specific needs and vulnerabilities of these groups. But in any case, to ensure that they are not only regarded as vulnerable, but actually as agents of change. And last but not the least, of course, in all these, as a matter of normative uh, principles, we naturally adopt a human rights-based approach. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We do agree with everything you say. <laughs> and now I am once again impressed by General Nibaruto's if was in Burundi, and I wish I could speak better French, but please, General, over to you. 
Merci beaucoup, Madame la Présidente, pour me remettre la parole. J'ai donc un petit message clé, je dois être bref. Et mon premier message clé concerne le développement d'un système d'alerte précoce pour réduire le nombre de personnes en déplacement suite à, à, au changement climatique. Le, le, le système d'alerte précoce permettrait aux communautés d'être averties sur les risques eh, qui sont en vue. Deuxième message concerne le développement de la culture du risque. Eh, ce développement de la culture du risque se ferait à travers des formations, des séances de formation et d'information. Et comme ça, les communautés seraient préparées pour mieux répondre aux urgences, ce qui leur permettrait de renforcer la résilience communautaire face aux catastrophes et la résilience communautaire est entendue comme un pont qui est entre euh, le domaine humanitaire et le domaine et celui de développement. Mon dernier message euh, clé, et ça serait euh, la communication. La communication est extrêmement importante dans le domaine de la gestion des risques de catastrophes. Il faudrait que pour mieux répondre aux urgences, il faudrait renforcer les capacités au niveau de la communication pour que les gens puissent savoir à quoi s'en tenir avant, pendant et après une situation d'urgence. Merci, madame. Merci beaucoup. Uh, je vous en prie. Uh, Mr. Andrew Harper had to leave for another session, so I'm now handing over to Ignacio, if you are ready to take the floor. Yes, for sure. Thank you very much. So, in, in addition to the five key messages, I would uh, bring another one, perhaps just to say that... Um, Um, we have to turn things, some of the things in a more positive aspect. Climate action is good for peace. And, uh, and I think that also has to be brought into uh, the, the way uh, our narrative, but also the way we work within the communities. And we must certainly redouble our efforts in reducing the needs building back better has to be more ambitious. It has to be reducing the needs. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. I think we've had a, an amazing two hours. I wish we had longer because these are huge issues. But I think we are all agreeing that there are opportunities to building back better. There are opportunities, there are solutions. We are there, we can work together with an holistic approach, coordinating, using a humanitarian development and peace approach to enhance climate mitigation and adaptation, including everyone in this process and have a participatory. I think there's enough work for all of us, so we don't have to fight about that. There will be a report from this event, and I think it's also recorded, so we can look at it again. With no further ado, I see we're a little bit over time, but I would like to thank everyone who's organized the event and everyone attending. And I wish we had more time, as I said, this is a huge issue and we will continue working on it. IOM is very, very dedicated to work across the Humanitarian Development Peace Nexus and to assist all of you in this endeavor. Deshan, would you like to have a last word before we close this session? Angelica, I, I just actually first wish to thank you for a brilliant moderation. I would like to thank you for the all panelists and all uh, participants that take the floor from the floor. And uh, I would like to welcome you for also tomorrow, uh, starting from 9 a.m. New York time or 3 p.m. Geneva time. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and have a good rest of the day. <laughs>